to become one. If you say yes to this question, if you say no to this, you separate. You separate yourself completely. And last but not least, marginalization. I don't know if we have marginalization here, but I know, I know we have it in France. You know, where you have Arabs who are not exactly in the French society because the French don't accept them, but they, they're not, they don't keep in touch with the, the Arabic country where they come from either, so they're completely marginalized. I don't think we have it here, but it's some of the research that they did. Chinese. Now, did Greek America follow an integration approach to adaptation? I, did, I think yes, and I proved that. Scientifically, with the research that I did. So here we have integrated individuals. Where do you, you see here, they become American, but at the same time, they maintain some of the characteristics. Here we have assimilated individuals where completely, completely have done away with their culture, with their language, with their ethnic characteristics. Then we have the separated individuals, and then we have the marginalized individuals. I told you I was going to make it a little more funny, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is, this is what? It's called, this is another term that's called symbolic ethnicity. Symbolikia ethnicotica. Dladi, tumase oti se elvinas, mona dane ki en iki paralas. Usually that happens to the third generation. Third generation, you know, it could, it could happen to the second generation. But usually, according to research, you know, the capios in the Irish, maybe one half, or maybe one fourth. And that day, he wears his green tie, you know, he fights in the parallel to both of them, St. Patrick's. So, this is ethnicity that is individualistic in nature, but without real social cost. Δηλαδή, όποτε αποφασίσεις να είσαι Έλληνας, είναι σε Έλληνας. Και πας στο πανηγύρι, τρως γύρω, χορεύεις και μετά ξυπνέσαι. Μετά από ένα χρόνο πάλι αποφασίσεις ότι είσαι Έλληνας. Ξέρετε ορισμένους που είναι έτσι. Υπάρχουν ορισμένοι. Ειδικά αυτό είναι με την τρίτη γενιά. Και αυτό το χαρακτηριστικό δεν το βρίσκουμε μόνο στην ελληνική παρικία. Το βρίσκουμε και σε άλλες. Έτσι, για να είμαστε δίκαιοι, διότι η έρευνα αυτή δεν γίνεται... Έπρεπε να κάνουμε έρευνα και σε άλλες παρικίες, να δούμε πώς συμπεριφέρονται. Their, their, their attitudes, their behaviors. So, I had to select six domains. I had to select six domains to do the research. The first domain, of course, has to do with the Greek language, which, you know, we all think that it's very important, right? Do we? Yes. 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 Bravo. <laughs> the second one is the, the Greek church, the Greek Orthodox Church. I think most of you, maybe all of you, belong to some kind of a, of a community. And the third one is the family, cultural orientation, and values. I mean, we do have values. One of the things that's very strong in the, in, the, in the Greek family is that we do have strong values. The fourth one is the cultural activities and organization membership. How many of you belong to an organization? What is this here? <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be a HEPA, it could be the Society of Condion, yeah. Society of Piloptocho, Kiprion, <laughs> right, Brother Achon? Let's see. Είσαι στην Κυπριακή Ομοσπονδία. Και πήγαμε και μαζί στην Κωνσταντινούπολη, ρε. Και στην Κωνσταντινούπολη πήγαμε μαζί. Το άλλο είναι continuing contact with Greece. How was the fifth and last but not least a political activity? You know, for how many years we run around for the Cyprus issue, for the Epirotico, for the Aegean issue. For, you name it. Macedonico, Macedonico, Podiakos, the genocide, you know, 
Asia Minor, they might be one half, or they might even be one third. I don't know what the percentages are. So, this is my methodology. I had to do a methodology, right, Professor? Okay. So, here. <laughs> so I got permission from the Metropolitan because I figured the best way to do it is to go through to the different communities. It was much easier. <laughs> Let's go, you know. Oops. And then I contacted a lot of priests. I said, look, please help me. I have the Evangelos permission, you know, this and that. Then the majority of the questionnaires were gathered with the researcher. Personally, yeah, I got into my car. The Pidina Sample Nobios Polypis Apo Pachia Se Pachia. So I covered the the, the, the the northern the northern part of, of the diocese or the metropolis as we call it these days, which is Ten of Life, which is St. John's, the theologian, all the way down to Virginia. In Norfolk, because I didn't go there, I knew the priest there, Archimandrite uh, Bowers, so I sent him the questionnaires that he was kind enough to gather about 30. So I had a good sample from 10 communities, which covered the whole geographic, you know, because there can be differences. Like you can come to our church in St. John Piscataway, St. George in Piscataway, and you, we have the liturgy, you can hear half Greek, half English. All the Salmodias, 90% are in Greek. But then you go 30 miles down the road, or 20 or 10 miles down the road to Trenton, and it's a different thing. All English. Maybe if Salty might, uh, you know, Sally, Stanley Mikan. But the priest? No, sir. You understand? So I had to cover. For my sample to have some validity, as I, it had to be from different ge geographic areas. So it wasn't that simple. So the participants filled out the information and returned the questionnaires during the coffee gathering. Yes, after the gathering, I'm sat here and say, please, attention, my name is Panos, please fill out these, you know, some, so many people would do that. I wouldn't let them go because once they go, could get it. They never get those back. So I would stay there. So I did this for a whole year. I was going around gathering, uh, you know, the material that I had to use. I gave out about a thousand, about a thousand questionnaires in order to get about 230 valid to, to use for the research. Now, so I had a lot of uh, diagrams, but I didn't want to <laughs> kill you with the diagram. So, but this is some of the quantitative approach that I use, you know, with statistics, which is the descriptive, categorical, frequencies, the inferential. I think maybe Lazaro understands that because he's a professor of economics. So, but uh, these are statistical research that I had to do. And then we see some of the demographics. As you see here, the second generation was most from my sample, 55%. How many of you here are second generation? That means you were born here. Okay, which makes sense because still it's pretty much a first generation organization. It was founded, this society was founded by first generation Greeks and that's why the majority here. But if you go to the different churches, what do you think most of the parishioners would be there? Would be first, first generation? No, sir. Sense? Yeah. So, most of the my sample, when you ask them, they would say, 76% uh, would say I'm a Greek American, as opposed to American or, or Greek. Uh, high education. We saw that there was 77% at least had a bachelor's degree. degree. And 60, oops, 66% they made over $50,000. Professionals, 71%, which is pretty high. And suburban, 77%. And 
as opposed to, you know, living in the, in the big city. So this is, I just wanted this slide just to show you some of the, how some of my diagrams look, the statistical diagrams, that's why I included this in here. And this is some of the statistical terms that I'm, that I'm using, but I'm not going to go into that because I'm going to lose most of you. Now, I believe we are, I had said that even, even before I finished this uh, dissertation, that the, the Greek language is going to be lost. And, uh, you know, a couple of times, people from the audience, they don't do that anymore. I'm talking about 10, 15 years ago, would uh, yell at me. And, you know, I'm very much in touch with the, the Greek language, you know. I, I came here when I was almost 16. And I think when I go to Greece, they don't know that I come. I don't even say one English word. That's how much in touch. That's how much affinity I have for the, for the Greek language. But, you know, I am pragmatic. I'm a pragmatic person. And I had to tell them, look, the, the Greek language is going to lose by the least if we can maintain the Greek sinidisi. What's the word sinidisi? I'm trying to find it. Conscious, but, you know, the, the Greek word has more power. Identity. I would, I would take the identity. Identity is more like a total down, something like this. But sinidisi, you know, so I said, if we can maintain that, that would be big win, you know? So, but let's see, why, why did we, why are we losing the Greek language? Well, first of all, in every way you go, they are not, they are not encouraging to speak, to be bilingual or trilingual in this country. In other countries, they do. Right? You agree with that? They don't. It is the second official language, unofficially. So, if someone, if one of our kids really wants to spend time to learn a second language, do you think, and do you think they're going to put more emphasis into learning Greek or Spanish? Spanish. Thank you. The other thing. But the learning of the Greek is a given for our kids. You think so? We'll discuss it. You see what the, what the, uh, what the findings show. That's what I thought, too, that it was a given. So, another thing is increasing rate of intermarriage, which could be an answer to what this young lady said. What happens when you have an intermarriage? Do you think, that, do you think a person who is not Greek is going to go out of his way or her way? I mean, he's, a, he's an exception to the rule, this man here. He's an exception. <laughs> Let's give you a nice round of applause. <laughs> Well, how many, how many do you know that resemble him? Very few. Yeah, very few. Okay. She knows Greek. She really does. Fine, but you are an exception. I know, and I admire you for that. And there's nothing wrong. I'm not saying that these people, there's something wrong with them, or they're not doing the right thing, or they're not doing the ethical thing. Why should they go out of the way? Why? There has to be a good reason. We have to sell it to them. And that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah, when you go to the suburbs, you know, I was living in Soria, right? I, left, I lived there for 22 years of my life. But you know, 75% of the time, 80% of the time, maybe even more, except when we were going to school, we would talk in what language? In Greek. Well, what happens when you go to the suburbs? You are among other ethnicities, and the common language is English. So then your children, unless you beat them up every day, <laughs> they're going to talk in English. And I find this with my children. That's why we're trying to go every year to... Greece, and it's costing me a bundle of money in order to, to maintain the language to the extent that we can. 
Even, even then we are having tremendous problems. Now, there's a highly linguistic. Now, I, nobody has shown this. I think I'm the first one that researched into this. There is a degree of closeness between languages. The highest degree is three. The lowest degree is one. So the closest language to English is Afrikaans, which is a dialect uh, from Dutch, Norwegian, and Swedish. Guess what? In every one of those countries, people speak English almost as good as they speak their own language, because it's very easy to them, for them. These are Germanic languages. Yeah, it comes from in the Greece, I mean, in English, is, is, is mostly Germanic. Of course, then it was Latinized, it was Hellenized in many ways, but originally it's, it's, it's a Germanic language. Greek is 1.75, so it's not very close. So from the linguistic point of view, it's not so easy for someone who is born here to learn Greek. You understand? So that's a factor too. Maybe it's not a major factor like the others, but still, it remains to be a factor. And another thing, in, 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 in most of the schools, they teach them, and then Len, you can attest to that, and I've seen it from my school, my wife is the director of the Sunday school, they teach them the language, but they don't try to instill into them what is Hellenism, why they have to learn the language. And many times kids resent it. My second son, she said, I don't want to go, years ago, I don't want to go to Greek school. I said, the door is there. You're on your own. He was eight years old, and he looked at me as if I were nuts. I said, the door is there. Go out, make a living, you know. So. All right. From my research, this was one of the strongest core values, the church. Now, of course, yes, the limitation is that, you know, my research was done within the perimeters of the church, right? But the majority of the participants agree, agree that it's important for people of Greek ancestry, and that were 77%, to attend the services that they actually attended in their behavior, 60%. In other words, their attitude is 77%, but the behavior is 60%. It's close. And then, 94% of the respondents of every generation, first, second, third, and young, believe that they had good or very good understanding <coughs> of the Orthodox faith. Here, I have to, to present my argument with that, from my own experience. I understand, somebody understands what the wedding is, the Greek wedding, you know, what the baptism is, you know, you know. So, it doesn't mean that you understand the sacraments. Because many times, on a personal level, I have asked people, what do you think about the sacrament of confession or this, this sacrament? They really didn't know much. So, I have my doubts about this. This is, this, is, this is very high. Okay, so we, we have the assimilation here. We have the intermarriage. The younger generation that, where's the younger generation here? <laughs> they have an agenda of their own. The conflict that exists, still exists to some extent between first generation Greeks and second and third. There's differences there, how to handle different situations. It's not, it's not, as, it's not as, as, as bad as it used to be when I was growing up, because then the first generation Greeks were younger, they were more aggressive, they were more, you know, it's my way or the highway, so there was a big conflict between first and second generation Greeks. In this case, in this one, the family values, there were more 
similarities that were shared by the first and second generation, while the third and beyond generation deviated from the first and second generation. You know, the second generation is closer to the first as far as tradition, even language, even going to church, being involved. But you see that it is a, a, a big deviation when you're going to, to the third generation. So, does the father has the final say? Do they give more freedom to the son, sons or the daughter from the old school? You probably say yes. Well, that's not the case. The attitudes. My children should have college education. Yeah, almost everybody said yes. And so they were pretty much consistent with that. People of Greek, Greek descent should marry people of Greek descent. My children should marry someone who is a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. Not really. You know, because, yes, you do have probably the majority of the first generation, but we put all the three generations, the second and the third generation, had a, a difference of opinion. Now, these are the attitudes, okay? The behavior. The behavior is in my family, we do honor and celebrate Greek heritage. First generation, 92% agree. Second, 92%, and third of the young, 81%. It's still pretty high. Still pretty high. I'm in frequent contact with family members who do not live in my home. First generation, 94%. Second generation, pretty close to the, to the first, but look at the third. It dropped to 78%. So you see the deviating. This domain, the Greek cultural activity. Yeah, feel sense of pride. Of course, most of the people who have a little bit of Greek blood in them, they feel a sense of pride. That's, uh, that's a given. Feel a strong bond with other Greeks, 88%. Support Greek heritage events, 86%. Actively participate. Greek newspaper programs, they listen to Greek music, they eat Greek food. They dance Greek dance frequently, sometimes. So there was a lot of consistency there. Study Greek history. Overall, this core value was maintained throughout the. Like, uh, like uh, the other day, I was watching TV, and the the, the 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 chairman of the Republican National Committee, the RNC, uh, Prebus. Uh, he's Greek. Uh, he's, uh, he's half Greek. From his mother. Yes. Yeah. But who, who would know from his name? And there is a lot of there's a lot of examples. On the other hand, you can see someone that has a Greek name and he has absolutely nothing in common with the or not he's not in touch with the Greek American community, doesn't know a, a Greek word, just has a name. But there's other people who might have a different name, whether it be Hispanic or uh, Anglo-Saxon or Germanic, and they feel more Greek and they might probably speak Greek as well. So we need these people to come and talk, who have a leadership position, either in business, in politics, in academia, to come and speak to us, to inspire us. That hasn't happened. You know, we need someone like Dr. Vangelos, who was Costa, he was the president of what? Merck. Big ph pharmaceutical Merck. company like Merck. 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 But we have an another example. one. We have another one. Dow Chemical. Liberis. Liberis. Exactly. Who was born in Australia. Absolutely. It's his grandfather who went to Australia. He has kept the name, both the first and the last name. Right. And uh, he really is one of the really big, big uh, guys in uh, Dao. Uh, sort of, well, Dao is uh, the CEO, but. Uh, yeah, but how he, does he, this he really help us? And the president of the new president of Walt Disney. <laughs> right? Carlo mm -hmm. Griegos. You keep 
saying the church, you know, but one of my daughters married outside the church. How are they going to reach them? How is the church going to reach her? Well, that's what we're talking about. That's That's what we're talking about. Now, the thing is that that's where a responsibility, a lot of responsibility, falls upon the, 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 the Hellenic part of the marriage. A lot of responsibility. And I can't tell, you know, I don't know exactly how your daughter uh, treated uh, her marriage, you know, whether she was diligent enough to convince the other party, look, it would be nice to be involved in the community as well. We'll be involved with your community, but let's be involved with our community as well. It's something, these are the things. I don't have the answers to all these things. I wish I did. I just did the research, and I'm just giving you the I'm giving you the findings. And that's why I'm saying maybe if we care enough, if we care enough, Maybe we can sit down and discuss it and see what would be the, the proper measures to take. That's, that's what I'm proposing here. I'm, ju- I'm just giving some of my own um, proposals. But, you know, there's people who are much smarter and much more prominent than I am who maybe can sit down and put their brains together and come up with some, some really good uh, formula. So that's another thing that I, you know, was quick not to cover before, which I think is very, very important. It's very, we have a lot of successful Greek Americans, a lot, in all over, in academia, in business, in business, forget it. I mean, we have so many. Why we don't see them in church? Why do we don't see them getting involved? That's, you know, now, Skalis is you know, it's something that, do they have to come to church? Suppose they don't want to come to church. Does it mean that, you see, that's another thing we have to discuss. Does someone have to be 100% Greek to be, in order, in order to be 100% Greek, he also has to be involved in the church? But where else can they go? Let's discuss it. You want to open up a, uh, a forum of discussion? Yeah, I think, I mean, find it, show here. I have, that is the church. But the church has to step up. The church has to think about it. But what is the church? What is the role of the church? Is it, is it uh, spiritual or secular or both? Is there a conflict between the church and the Hellenists? That's a good question. Is there a conflict? Some. You see, there's some cafetes erotices. Yes, that's interesting. No, <laughs> this, 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 reliance, this, this reliance on the church is very, very difficult because churches in general are losing attendance, not just here in this country, everywhere, around the world. And Europe, forget it, Europe has almost uh, the easiest real estate to buy these days in Europe are churches because they're dying. And the United States is following. The Greek church is doing relatively well here, but only relatively well. Other churches are diminishing faster. But our turn is going to come. People don't want to go to church for whatever reason. They are agnostics, they are whatever. So if we're going to, if Hellenism is going to rely on the church, it's going to rely on something that is, doesn't have a future, at best they can maintain what they have, probably not. So we better find another way to, another vehicle, or another venue to keep Hellenists going besides the church. Okay. Uh, the core, the core of Hellenism today is the church. We have uh, a religious uh, representation, but we don't have political representation. That's a good point. So we have to move that direction also. That's a good point. Anything else? Do, do you think there is a, a stigma being a Greek? A lot of people don't want to say I'm a Greek. You, you get some people talking about a Greek Greek, he's a Greek, he's American Greek, and a Greek Greek. And there is a, a stigma against being Greek, and I think we have to find out 
what the stigma is and try to eliminate it, get it out of the way. Um, I give you an example, like um, my grandkids, we, we, we tell them to go to grip school, right? And he says, Papu, we don't learn anything. Thelo uh, and Amilo, Thelo, they learn some things, Yayamu, Muibe, and we're not teaching them right. Otherwise, we invented the word. History comes. We invented the word alphabet. And if you ask any kids in the Greek schools we have, they don't know that they, if you know the alphabet, you can read anything in Greek. They, they, they teach them the, the wrong things. They, we don't have the proper education. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the proposals. These are proposals that I have here after doing that. Although um, I have a younger son, he didn't want to go to Greek school. Every summer he went to Spain to learn Spanish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So you wind up because wait, I... Wait, wait, stop. What did I say before? Yeah. Yeah. It took the kids to... Yeah. What did I say before? It's, it's, it's not that I'm a prophet. Research did. shows. Right. I'm not a prophet. No. Please, continue. Oh, because I told them, you know, you're going to learn a second language. That has to be Spanish, the second language. You have to learn your, your mother, mother land, uh, language, Greek. Uh, but it wind up to, to help him a lot, learn Spanish, because he... Right now, he's a director of Merck Pharmaceuticals because he speaks Spanish. <laughs> uh, for, to, to t we have to give value to the being Greek. Um, I don't know if you remember way back uh, when I was in the Aheba, there used to be a Supreme Court judge in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That he, when he retired, he made it the, his job to go around and lecture to different clubs. He would speak for an hour. That's what we need. In, in English without using one single English word. And I think that we should give more emphasis, I think, the church, the schools, or whatever, that Greek is, a, is the most popular language in the world because it's used in medicine, in science, in, in everything. And um, we, are not, we are not giving the, the kids to understand how valuable it is. And come back to my younger son, when he went to the University of Pennsylvania, a month later he called me and he says, uh, thank you. I said, for what? For naming me Socrates. I said, why? Because I got free membership into all the clubs. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the benefits too. But uh, he, being Greek, you know, it was a plus for him, you know. And, the, and we don't stress that to our kids, to our uh, families nowadays. Exactly. And that's why uh, we have this over here. Yeah. That we really make, have to make it more meaningful for them. Anybody wants to add anything? Well, my yeah. first experience with Greece was when I was in university, and I took an architecture course, and we also studied the classics in English uh, as part of our study. So I think a lot of university students who uh, um, come in with English 101, um, you know, they, they go to the foundation of a lot of literature, uh, which comes from the classical Greek. So I, for one, was introduced in, in that manner, and then I picked up on And just seeing the American Revolution uh, was uh, adopted the Greek style to get away from the Georgian English architecture. And they took the classical Greek as the embodiment of democracy. So, I, you know, the university level is where a lot of people are introduced to uh, the true meaning of, you know, what it means to be when they can comprehend it uh, on an adult level. Excellent. So that's one aspect. Certainly, you have to look at the developmental. So you have uh, venues like the Greek church, or we used to have a Greek school, uh, where you can cultivate it uh, uh, in dialogue and debate and family conversation and whatnot, being forced outside the house. So there, there are many ways. It's a lifetime, it's a lifelong learning experience. And in essence, you know, somebody has brought this issue before, and uh, the problem we have with the Greek schools here in the churches that we do, we are we're not using the modern methods to teach our kids uh, the Greek. Uh, for instance, in our church, we used to have a problem of uh, the director would say, you are 16 years old, you go in this class. You are 12 years, you go to this class. And uh, when I was a president, I had to fight with them all the time. How can you put 
a kid that comes from a, a second generation, uh, parents and the children, the only thing they know to say, Calimera and Calispera, and put them in the same class with a kid that just came from Greece. So the teacher would call the other kid stupid because he doesn't speak Greek. What kind of Greek are you? And I said, why don't you take these kids, no matter what age, put them in by performance in different classes? And this is a, a big, serious problem today all over the United States with the church Greek school we have, you know. We don't push on performance, we just put on any other metal stage. There is no program otherwise. There is not the universal program. How to educate our kids. Okay. And you have okay. to make it fun. You yeah. have to make it fun. Because a lot of times in some of the churches, at least in ours, it's like some of the teachers, the old traditional way, you know. And I can't come on deal, you know, you know very structured thing, you have to make it fun. It's a second language, so you have to attract them. You have to make them want it. You have to make it fun. With my daughter, I playfully got her into dancing, playfully got her into language. You have to play around with it, make it want it. She's more Greek than I am. She, was, she loves Greece, she loves to go to Greece, but we have to play with the kids. I see a lot of parents don't participate, they go to a dance, go kids dance. I'm like, get in there with your kid, dance. Open up, talk to them in Greek, participate with activities, participate with whatever it takes to make them want it. That's, that's my opinion. You have to get involved with them. It's not that you just send them to school and learn it. Make it fun when they come home. Say, okay, what's the, the, the word that we have today? The Greek word we're going to play around with. Make sentences with it. You have to make it playful in a young age until they get into it and they want it rather than the structure of school. You go in there. Make it a little more fun, make it a little more exciting for them to want it. It's a lot of work, but I, I think that's the one way you can keep them in there. That's the one way to keep them in there. With my own grandkids and, all, and my kids, I find out that uh, my other two kids, they speak very good Greek and all. And the Ionian village come to Belat. Oh, yeah. They went twice to the Ionian village, they came back speaking. Uh, my grandkids go to Cyprus and they they say, but who, you know, all the kids, they want to try to, sp they want to learn English from us, instead of teach us Greek. <laughs> so, but so, going to expose them to Greece or Cyprus or whatever is a very good uh, education for them. Absolutely, but again, I will, I will, forgive me for that, I will come back to the Jews, who will pay a lot of the young Jewish American kids to go to Israel for free and spend two or three weeks there. And do, if they do that consistently, you see, that's another thing. We, sometimes we do something, or the, the, or the Greek government does something, well, that's a mess there. I want not, I'm not going to go even there. I'm not going to go there. But at least if we here do things consistently, then it becomes part of the process, and it is to be expected. You see, and that's what makes, that's what will make the difference. Consistency will make the difference. All these things, the, the, all these are valid points, are very valid points. You are right, Mom. You are right when you say take them there to Greece. I worked at Ionia Village. I was the director of the Greek department. And uh, the kids were coming there and have such a negative attitude about Greece. And we were out one day and we saw like an older lady had this pen, you know, post pano sto furno na psisume to chai. And all the kids are like, oh my God, and I'm like, relax, back off and just enjoy for what it is. I said, this is where your grandparents came from. This is how they lived. Just enjoy what you're seeing right now. And when they see it, eventually with communicating with them and talking to them and make them understand this is who they are. Don't place them to where you are, accept them for what they are and where they stand and then work with that, and then eventually, you saw the negative attitude just vanished away, and they were like, you know, you're right. And I said, think about it. What you have in the States, people like that work very hard in the States to give you what you have, to right. give you the home, to give you the Mercedes, the BMW, whatever you have, you know? These are the people that make but when they see it, and they leave it, and they have somebody to help them explain it, then it starts clicking in that, hey, yeah, you know? We're not, you know, we have to accept them where they are. We have to deal with it. We have to understand it. We have to understand yeah. it. Uh, that somebody's 